Yes. Order. I have a short statement to make about the conduct of today's Prime Minister's question time. It is exceptional. I will run Prime Minister's questions until one o'clock. It will serve as an effective replacement for separate statements on the situation of coronavirus. I will allow the Leader of the Opposition two sets of questions of six, so the total of twelve, which I expect to be taken in two sets of six. Similarly, I will allow the Leader of the second largest party four questions in two sets of two. I will also exceptionally call a further question from an opposition front bench spokesperson. In order to maximise participation, can I ask for short questions and short answers? We now start Prime Minister's questions with Susanna Webb. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in the House, I will have further such meetings later today. Susanna Webb. Firstly, I would like to pay tribute to the Prime Minister and his ministers for navigating my constituents through these unprecedented times with your decisive action. Tribute also to my constituents and those working in the NHS for your truly heroic work. No one can afford to be complacent during this time, and I applaud the Right Honourable Friend's address to the nation on Monday, which reinforced the need for us to stay at home, protect our NHS, in order to save lives. Can he assure me that the Government will ensure the people have the support they need in order to do so? Uh, Mr Speaker, I fully echo her tribute to our amazing NHS workers, and it is in order to uh, protect them and to help them that we are taking the extraordinary measures uh, that this country is. And I repeat my advice to the, the nation, which is to stay at home, protect our NHS and save lives. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and thank you for making the best arrangements possible today to ensure that as many members as possible can ask questions, but also that uh, the government is held to account, which is what the function of Parliament is. Many more people will be mourning the loss of loved ones as a result of coronavirus this week. Our hearts go out to all of them and to those suffering from the disease at the present time. Across our country, people are working day and night to keep us safe, fed and warm. Our wonderful NHS staff, police, firefighters, prison and probation workers, teachers, civil servants, local government staff and social care all of them are showing the value of public service. They are the unsung heroes, keeping the transport system running, the post delivered, utilities running, and our supermarkets properly stocked. I'd like to pay special mention to one group that are usually ignored, forgotten, and decried as unskilled workers, cleaners. All around the country and in this building are doing their best to keep our places hygienic and safe. Over the past few weeks, I've asked the Prime Minister many times what action has been taken to ensure testing has been prioritised, and I've received assurances that everything that could was being done. Yet, Mr Speaker, a leaked email shows it was just three days ago that the Prime Minister wrote to UK research institutes to ask for help saying that there was no testing machines available to buy. Why wasn't this done weeks ago, if not months ago, when the Government was first warned about the threat of a global pandemic, and what, does, what action is now being taken to get testing machines? Mr Speaker, perhaps I could uh, begin by pointing out that this is the Right Honourable Gentleman's last uh, Prime Minister's questions, and it would be appropriate, I think, for me to pay tribute to uh, him uh, for his service to party and, indeed, to the country over the last four years in a very difficult job. Uh, we may not agree about everything, but no one can doubt his sincerity and his determination to build a better society. And I want to pay particular tribute and thanks to him and all his colleagues for their uh, cooperation in the current uh, emergency as far as possible across party lines. I agree with him uh, very much about, in what he said about cleaners. Uh, they do an extraordinary uh, job and they des deserve all the protection and support that we can give them in this difficult time. And on testing, uh, he, is, he is quite right that testing is vital to our success in beating 
the coronavirus. And as the health secretary has explained many times, we are massively increasing our testing campaign, going up from 5,000 to 10,000 uh, to 25,000 a day. And uh, in answer directly to his question, uh, this has been a priority of uh, this government ever since uh, the, the crisis was obviously upon us, like, for weeks and weeks. Rick Corbyn. I thank the Prime Minister for his very kind remarks. Um, I believe in a decent, socially just society. And he was talking as though this was a sort of obituary. Just to let him know, my voice will not be stilled. I'll be around, I'll be campaigning, I'll be arguing, and I'll be demanding justice for the people of this country and indeed the rest of the world. We can only protect the health of us all Mr. Speaker, if we protect the health of our carers. Yet the charity Sue Ryder, who provide care to people with neurological conditions, have said that their workforce is depleting daily as they have no access to tests. When will all the social care staff have access to regular testing? They are very, very important and obviously very, very vulnerable in this crisis. He's, he's entirely right. I don't, I don't want to repeat what I've just said, except to say that social care staff, in common with NHS staff and indeed uh, other uh, public sector workers, uh, need to be tested as fast as possible. And uh, the answer is, to his question is we will do it as fast as possible. Jeremy Corbyn. Obviously, if they have to self isolate because they suspect they have the disease and can't get a test, then their work is lost for a week. Um, and obviously those that need the care and support don't get it at that time. There are reports that care homes workers are being turned away from supermarkets in relation to priority shopping, <coughs> not being allowed to buy more than certain items that they desperately need to feed their residents. What is the Prime Minister's plan for making sure that care workers can get the vital food and supplies they need for the people that they're caring for? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I, as, as, he, as he can um, and the House can imagine, uh, we've been in regular contact with all the uh, the retailers, all the supermarket uh, chains. Uh, I had a conversation with uh, all of them uh, a couple of days ago, and they were absolutely determined to ensure that key workers uh, do get time uh, in supermarkets. If, if there is a particular problem, I, I'm, I will raise it with them again. Jeremy Corbyn. I hope the Prime Minister will, because care workers are on the front line looking after the most vulnerable people within our society, and keeping our care homes safe and well should be and must be an absolute priority. The Prime Minister has been saying for quite a long time that NHS staff will get the equipment they need, yet the Health Care Supply Association the Health Care Supply Association just get that has been forced to use Twitter to ask DIY shops to donate protective equipment to NHS staff. This is an appalling situation. When will NHS staff, social care staff and community nurses and all other staff relating to health care get the PPE equipment they absolutely desperately need? Well, Mr Speaker, I can tell him, and he's absolutely right to, to raise this issue. I know this has been uh, a concern, and uh, we had a, a, a long meeting on it this morning, but I'm assured that the, not only are the stocks there, now the Army is, is now distributing the supplies to all the NHS staff, all the hospitals that need it, and in the last 24 hours, uh, they have distributed 7.5 million uh, pieces of equipment. Jeremy Corbyn. It's important they get it because yesterday 77% of NHS chiefs who responded to a survey said that the lack of staff testing and staff shortages were the two biggest areas of concern for them. Last week, the Prime Minister stood in this chamber at the dispatch box and said that he would, and I quote, protect private renters from eviction. He absolutely said that. Yet, some renters will be getting eviction notices as early as next week. The Prime Minister appears to have gone back on his word. So will he now finally absolutely ban evictions for six months in line with the renewal period of the emergency legislation which is going through its parliamentary process at the moment? 
uh, he raises a very important point about the need to protect renters, which is why I uh, answered in the way I did uh, last week. Uh, we've actually gone further now, uh, as he knows, by lifting up the local uh, housing allowance to the 30th percentile of median rents, which will be very important for many people on low incomes across the, the country. Uh, but we are also, as he knows, uh, making sure that uh, no fault evictions are, uh, are, are no longer legal, and that is part of the bill. Well, unfortunately, this isn't what the reality is on the ground, as many of my colleagues will point out. We are getting constituents in touch with us who are being threatened with eviction now because they are in rent arrears, because they cannot work because of the shutdown over coronavirus. Can we just be absolutely clear, and will the Prime Minister make sure it's legislated that nobody can be evicted during this first six-month period of this emergency from the private rented sector? I'm going to continue my questions shortly, um, Mr Speaker, in the second part of this session. But I just want to ask this question to the Prime Minister. Many British people abroad feel a bit abandoned by their government, with many fast running out of medicines, with the host countries in lockdown, flights being cancelled, accommodation cancelled, and insurance either about to expire or not covering the much-needed costs until they're able to return home. These British citizens have a a right to turn to their own government for help, and our long de delays on phone calls are not acceptable. They feel abandoned. Can the Prime Minister, as the Foreign Secretary was asked to do yesterday, update the House on what his government is doing to bring people home and provide the emergency costs for the medical needs that many British residents abroad actually have at the present time? Uh, Mr Speaker, he can take it that we are certainly doing everything we can to uh, bring back uh, British uh, nationals, British citizens from abroad. A huge operation is going on now to, to repatriate them, as he will have heard both from uh, the Health Secretary and, and indeed uh, the Foreign Secretary. Where we, are pro we are protecting uh, renters in spite of what he says. We are, uh, we are doing everything we can to protect our fantastic NHS. Uh, we are putting, as a society now, we are doing a quite as a country, we are doing a quite extraordinary thing, which is for the first time in our history to get through this crisis. We are putting our arms as a country around every single worker, every single employee in this country. We are, and and it, is a, it, is a quite, it is a quite unprecedented step, and he will be hearing more. And I know, that, I know there are concerns about the self-employed, but he will be hearing more in the next couple of days uh, from uh, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor. I can tell him that, and I think as he said, he said something the other day about this, how this country would come through this experience changed and changed for the better. And, and there, he and I completely agree. And we will get this country through this crisis with these exceptional steps. And I can tell him that we will do absolutely everything that it takes. We will do whatever it takes to get our country through it together. We will beat it together. But the most important advice I can give him uh, as he retires to his uh, I hope, I'm delighted to hear he's not uh, retiring. And I think that, that, that'll, be, that'll be warmly welcomed warmly welcome by his, his successor. Uh, the, the, most, the, most important thing, the most important thing we can all do is stay at home to protect our NHS and to save many thousands of lives. Yeah. Bradley. Mr Speaker, can I thank my right honourable friend for his leadership and his cabinet's leadership at this incredibly difficult time and for the package of measures already announced that will support millions of people uh, and protect them from financial hardship. The government's uh, advice is clear, as he's just said, stay home, support the NHS, protect lives. Can you help more people to make the right decision uh, by giving an absolute assurance to the 5,000 self-employed people in Mansfield that he is seriously considering measures he might take to be able to help them to do that? I, I, I thank my honourable friend very much for, for raising that, and uh, he's, he's entirely right. I know that that thought, as the, as the right honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, has just said, that's uppermost in, in people's minds. We've produced a quite incredible uh, package to uh, support the businesses and the workforce of this country. Uh, we do need to ensure that we protect the self-employed as well, and he'll be hearing more about that in the next couple of days. Yeah. Ian Blackford. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I must say, in response to the questions from the Leader of the Opposition, we all need to do what we can to bring all our people home, and it needs to happen now. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister said that the UK is putting its arms round all our workers. 
I hope that that will become the case, because as of today, it is not. Yeah, yeah. This morning, the Resolution Foundation estimated that one in three people in self-employment, a total of 1.7 million workers, are now at risk of losing their income. In Scotland, that means that 320,000 self-employed people are deeply concerned about the jobs and the families they support. Last Friday, the self-employed were promised by the Prime Minister <coughs> and by his Chancellor that help was coming. Only yesterday, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury told them, we have not forgotten you, help is coming. These are the same promises that have now been made for weeks, and yet they and we are still waiting. Can the Prime Minister now explain why a package for the support for the self-employed was not put in place before we announced the lockdown? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, as he, as he will understand, uh, we have done a, a huge amount already to uh, strengthen the, the safety net for everybody in this country, uh, not just those uh, currently in employment, as I say, with a, a package so that they get 80 per cent of their earnings up to £2,500 per month. This, this country has never done anything on that scale before, and we have increased the universal credit by £1,000 a year, as he knows. Uh, we have deferred income tax uh, self-assessments for the self-employed uh, until July. We are deferring uh, VAT until the next quarter, as he knows. There is access to government financed loans, but there are particular complexities. About the, about the self-employed, which uh, do need to be addressed. They are not all in the same position, and uh, all I can say is that we are working as fast as we possibly can to get the appropriate package of support for everybody in this country. And that is what we are going to do, and we will get through it together. Yeah, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister knows that we want to work with him on this, but there is frustration, because we have gone into lockdown, and workers are without income. This is an emergency. The truth is that the health and economic costs of this virus are deepening by the day. People deserve strong leadership, financial support, and they deserve straight answers. As we stand here, these people are losing their incomes. Telling them to wait another day simply isn't good enough. In Norway and Denmark, wage support schemes have already been extended to cover the incomes of the self-employed. In Germany, there is a €50 billion Euro programme to ensure the self-employed do not go bankrupt. In Ireland, the self-employed are eligible for a special pandemic payment of €350 Euros a week. The Scottish Government has written to the Chancellor, asking him to expand the jobs retention scheme he announced last week to include the self-employed. Can the Prime Minister confirm that when the Chancellor eventually does announce measures, there will be parity and equality of support between the already announced job retention scheme and the new scheme for the self-employed. They must not be left behind, Prime Minister. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, he's making a very, a very important point, and I, I totally share his, uh, his, his desire to get uh, parity of, of support. I would just remind him that we have extended uh, mortgage holidays. We are giving all sorts of help, uh, all sorts of interest-free loans to everybody across the whole country. There are particular difficulties with those who are not on PAYE schemes, as he, uh, I think the whole House understands. We are bringing forward a package to ensure that everybody gets the support that they need. That that's the way to get this country through it. But uh, if I may say so, the better we tackle the epidemic now, the more uh, vigorously we're able to uh, suppress the disease now, the faster we will come through it. And that means, and that means, that means yes, it certainly means testing, but it means uh, staying at home, protecting the NHS, and thereby saving lives. Jen Stevens. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Wolverhampton has sadly already seen many cases of COVID-19, and I'm sure the Prime Minister would like to join me in thanking all the staff at New Cross Hospital in my constituency. Would he also thank the many volunteers coming forward to help their neighbours in Wolverhampton, but also say to the few people who are trying to flout the advice to stay at home that their actions will cost lives? Uh, 
Mr Speaker, I would indeed like to thank all the staff uh, at, uh, at New Cross Hospital in Wolverhampton for everything that they're doing. I thank everybody in the NHS across the whole country. And uh, just since, since yesterday, when we uh, asked for, uh, for volunteers to come uh, forward, uh, we've seen a huge uh, uh, number of people, 170,000 people, uh, asking to volunteer to do whatever they can to support, and tens of thousands and thousands of doctors and nurses coming back uh, to our fantastic NHS. And I, I pay tribute to every one of them. Some of them, I may say, Mr Speaker, in this House of Commons. Yes. Given the critical incident there last week, and tragically uh, that it has recorded one of the highest levels of deaths so far, the Prime Minister will understand that there is considerable concern about the situation at Northwick Park yes. Hospital that serves my constituents and many, uh, many others. Can he tell the House, therefore, when he expects the staff at the hospital to have access to the high-grade personal protection equipment they need, and crucially to the testing equipment as and when they need it to keep them safe, to prevent the risk of cross-infection and to keep their loved ones safe. He, he's absolutely right, Mr Speaker, to raise the issue at, at Northwick Park, uh, and uh, they've had a consignment in the last few days, and we will keep those supplies coming. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. There's no doubt that our nation and our world is under, under attack from an aggressive virus which intends to infect every one of us, sometimes with deadly consequence. And it seems to me that in uncertain times we need clarity and leadership, and I want to commend the Prime Minister for the leadership and the clarity he's given in the messages coming from government, where well, we know them all very clearly, which is to protect the NHS, save lives, and by staying at home. Um, but can I ask the Prime Minister, um, will you confirm that he will lift any of these measures imposed at the earliest possible opportunity once he knows that our nation is safe? Uh, yes, of course, Mr Speaker, and we keep them under constant review. And the, 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 the more uh, the whole country is able to work together to uh, conform uh, with, those, uh, with those stipulations, the faster we'll get on top of it, the faster, uh, Mr Speaker, we'll come out of it. Peter Kyle. Mr Speaker, through the Prime Minister, can I thank his ministers who have been working very constructively, particularly from the Department of Health, with uh, members from across the House on, uh, in these difficult times. They have asked us to report back difficult situations in our patch. Uh, in that light, I'd like to draw attention to the fact that the Oakland's care home in my constituency has had a really difficult time lately. A 94-year-old resident got the, uh, developed the symptoms of coronavirus and requested a test. Ten days later, ten days later when the test finally happened, 14 of the 20 residents were exhibiting symptoms. Seven of the staff were off sick so, so they could self-isolate. They were agency staff who'd also been working in other care homes. None of the protective equipment requested had arrived. Can the Prime Minister tell the House, in the 80,000 care homes around Britain, what date will they expect tests to be carried out on the day that symptoms emerge and every single person working in those care homes will get the protective equipment they need? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, on the, on the, on the test, uh, I, as I said earlier on, the answer is we're, we want to roll that out as soon as we possibly can. And on the, on the, on the personal protective equipment, the answer is by the end of this week. Alexander Stafford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, assure me that he is in regular contact with supermarkets and food suppliers to ensure that goods are getting to the shelves where they are needed? And will he join me in calling on people to only take what they need not to stockpile and to stamp out the disgusting scourge of black marketing profiteering. Uh, yes, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker, and I think the profiteering uh, is something that we should be looking at uh, from a legislative point of view uh, in this House, as, as has happened before in this country. And, uh, but I can tell him that uh, the supermarkets do have adequate uh, supplies. Our supply chains, as, as my honourable friend knows, are, are very good. Uh, we've relaxed d delivery hours, but it is very, very important that everybody in their shopping uh, acts reasonably and considerately uh, for other people. Bentley. Mr Speaker, I would like to convey by Cymru's thanks to the health workers, social care workers, teachers, cleaners and all those who are fighting this virus on the front line. Today, an elderly constituent telephoned my office in dismay that she and her husband are struggling for ways to get food. Both are vulnerable, both are self-isolating according to government advice. They have been told that the next available delivery food slot is April 16th. What support can the government offer to ensure vulnerable people 
in remote and rural areas such as Ceredigion are prioritised for food deliveries. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm told that there is a, a, an army of local volunteers who are delivering food supplies, but uh, if he wishes to communicate that case directly to us, we'll take it up. Rob Butler. Does the Prime Minister share my concern that the contractors for HS2 Limited are not following the very clear government advice on coronavirus? This is not to be clear about the rights and wrongs of HS2, it is about the safety of us all, because my constituents have seen not only contractors blatantly fail to the rules about social distancing, they've observed them coughing over concerned residents, causing great distress. Should they stay at home to save lives? Mr Speaker, we've been very clear that uh, everybody should work at home if they possibly can and uh, construction should only take place in a way that is in accordance uh, with public health, England and industry advice. Tracy Brevin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Charities, including those on the front line of our national response to coronavirus, working with the seriously ill, the elderly, the young victims of domestic violence, and providing food to the vulnerable, they're in absolutely dire straits, and they face a $4.3 billion drop in income. Furloughing staff providing essential services to the vulnerable is just frankly not an option. When is the Prime Minister going to come forward with an urgent package, as my honourable friends for Cardiff South and Penarf and Lewisham Deptford and 150 colleagues from eight parties across the House have been calling for so that they can continue their life-saving work. Mr Speaker, she's absolutely right to pay tribute to the work of the voluntary sector, the charitable sector. Uh, They are are crucial to our national response to this crisis and so we are indeed looking, um, my honourable friend the the Culture Secretary and my honourable friend the Chancellor, are looking at a package of measures uh, to support charities as well. John Barrow. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister, I commend the Prime Minister and all those on the front line um, for ha- their handling of this situation. And he will know, I've raised with him previously, the importance of reaching out to all the elderly and the vulnerable who live alone regardless of their health so that no one is left behind. But as a former Secretary, may I raise with him the plight of the British Council? It is running out of money. They have had to cease their commercial activities and their, ex- their reserves will be exhausted within weeks. Can he make funding available? Uh, Mr Speaker, I I came to to love the British Council when I was doing the job uh, he he refers to. uh, We will continue to uh, support it in in any way uh, that we can, and uh, we're actively looking into what we can do. Mr Speaker, when all this is over, I think the Prime Minister will genuinely have earned himself a proper break on a paradise island. And in that regard, can I commend to him the paradise islands of Orkney and Shetland? where we have a fantastic tourism offer built up over many decades, but which have at its heart the tour guides, the craft businesses, the small food and drink businesses who are overwhelmingly self-employed. So will the Prime Minister give an assurance today to these self-employed people that when the offer of help comes, they will not be in any worse a position than they would be if they were in employment? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I cannot you know, in all candour promise the House that we will be able to get through this crisis without any kind of hardship at all. But I, what I can tell, and he, and he and I have talked uh, uh, face-to-face about uh, the, the issue that he raises, we will, we will do whatever we can to support the, uh, the self-employed, uh, just as we are putting our arms around every single employed person in this country. And I well understand the point that he makes. And he should be, um, as for his, his generous invitation, uh, he should be careful uh, what he wishes for. Well, Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I join colleagues from across this House in congratulating and thanking the Prime Minister for his strong leadership at yeah, this current yeah, time, yeah, which yeah, has yeah. provided a great reassurance for my constituents in Blackpool South. Will the Prime Minister um, continue to work with the voluntary and charity, voluntary sector and charity groups to ensure that vulnerable people continue to get the support they need from this Government during this challenging time? Uh, yeah, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker, and that's why we've given, uh, in the first instance, another half a billion pounds uh, to councils to look after the, the poorest and most vulnerable members of, of society, and I thank him for his support. Chris Stevens. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will have heard my question to the Secretary of State for Scotland. There are companies defying his advice, which is, which is guided for public health and to save lives. 
So can he tell the House, and for those watching, Absolutely. what the consequences are of businesses who are still operating who shouldn't be today? Mr Speaker, where, where businesses are blatantly, uh, blatantly uh, ignoring the instructions of, of the government, then th they will face the consequences that have been uh, well advertised, Mr Speaker. Jeremy Hunt. Speaker, can I salute the tone of the Prime Minister's very difficult, sombre address to the nation on Monday night? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I know that heroic efforts are happening to ramp up the amount of testing. Could the Prime Minister give us some idea as to when we will be able to get back to routine testing in the community, as happens in Korea and Germany and other countries? And should we not now introduce weekly tests for NHS staff so we can remove from them the fear that they might be infecting their own patients? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I can tell the House that both on, uh, on anti antibody testing uh, and, and on antigen testing, we are making huge progress. We were, we're buying millions of, of antibody tests to, to, to show whether or not you've had the disease. And on his, on his point that has been raised several times about how soon can we get uh, NHS staff and other public sector workers tested uh, in, in advance to see whether they currently have the disease, the answer to that is as soon as we possibly can. New London. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Thousands of jobs in my constituency and nearly a million across the UK rely on the aviation industry for, for work from pilots to baggage handlers and cabin crew to security staff and many, many more. The aviation industry is vital now and will be crucial when we come out of this dreadful coronavirus situation. The Chancellor and the Transport Secretary committed to a bespoke support package, but yesterday he wrote to industry to renege on that commitment. Can the Prime Minister tell the industry why his government have washed its hands of it? Yep. Um, I can tell the Honourable Gentleman we have certainly not washed our hands of any sector uh, of UK business or industry. We are in regular contact uh, with the aviation uh, sector, doing everything that we can uh, to help, and already uh, that sector and others have schemes such as Time to Pay and, and many other loan support schemes already available. But I can assure him, Mr Speaker, that there are other contacts uh, going on as we speak. We're going to now start the second part of Prime Minister's questions. I'm going to open with Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and again, thank you for making the arrangements that you have today so that more colleagues can come into the Chamber. It is a little odd, however, that we're having to have a double session of Prime Minister's question time to question the Prime Minister when he himself should have volunteered to come here and make a statement at some length on the subject rather than just doing it through press conferences and television addresses. This House is the place where the Government should be held to account. Construction sites, Mr Speaker, are still operating, still working on non-emergency work, despite the new rules. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster said yesterday that sites will continue to stay open. We heard this morning on the radio a call from a self-employed construction worker who said that he had contracted coronavirus, he was suffering from it, he knew he had got it, but had no other option but to get on the London tube and go on to a site to work, obviously putting himself at greater risk and putting all other passengers and all other workers on that site at risk. Why was he doing it? Because his site had not been closed down, he had no other source of income to feed his family. So he's going to work, making all of us more at risk as a result. So can the Prime Minister be absolutely clear and give unequivocal guidance now that construction work on non-emergency work should stop now? Mr Speaker, every body should work at home unless they must go to, go to work. And every business that can, uh, unless they have no alternative, they, they cannot do that work from home. If if a, a business is continuing, a construction company is continuing, then clearly they should do so in accordance with the guidance of Public Health England, and they have a duty of care to their employees. But overwhelmingly what we are saying to the people of this country is that unless you need to, to leave the house to take exercise uh, for medical reasons or to buy essential supplies, 
you should stay at home and protect the NHS and save lives. Jeremy Corbyn. Obviously, people should stay at home and protect others. But if they have no other source of income, then these very difficult, very personal choices are going to be made. And as a result, we're all put at greater risk as a result of it. The self-employed are having to choose whether they go to work or stay at home or face losing their entire livelihood, relying instead on an overstretched welfare system, which could pay as little as £94 per week. One self-employed person said they need to pay for baby food, rent, council tax and insurance for the car they use for work. Faced with the decision to feed your family and pay your bills or stay at home and not get paid, why is it taking the Prime Minister so long to guarantee income for all self-employed workers. There are millions of them. Our economy has changed. Absolutely. Well, Mr Speaker, we are making absolutely clear to everybody in this country that uh, they should stay at home and, uh, and save lives. But when it comes to the self-employed and the particular pressures that he, uh, he raises, I think I've now said... Uh, several times already in this, in this chamber in answer to other honourable members that we are shortly bringing forward a package. And I think that he would, he would recognise that the steps that the government has taken to provide support uh, for uh, workers, for employees in this country are quite exceptional and unprecedented. And they were warmly welcomed, I may say, uh, by the trades unions themselves. Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker, I'm asking questions about the self-employed and those on zero hours contract and those with no recourse to public funds who have no support. They are in a very difficult situation and he should understand that there are many of our constituents, for every member of this House, our constituents lead a hand-to-mouth existence. A few days' pay lost is catastrophic for them. And time and time again, government ministers have told us that workers affected by the crisis could get help via universal credit. Last night, there were queues of over 110,000 people trying to get onto the DWP system in order to register to apply for universal credit. Will the Prime Minister now put extra resources and funding to boost the DWP capacity and relax the often quite draconian requirements on people claiming so that money gets where it's needed quickly to those people who've got to feed the kids, got to pay the rent, got to survive somehow. Uh, Mr Speaker, he's, per he's perfectly right. Uh, and that's why we've increased the funding for universal credit uh, so that uh, it goes up by £1,000 a year. That will benefit uh, 4 million of the most vulnerable households in the country. And overall, we're putting another £7 billion uh, into the, the welfare system altogether. And as I say, uh, we will be bringing forward a package for the self-employed. But what we are not doing, and this is fully in accordance with the, the scientific and medical advice, what we are not doing is uh, closing down the whole UK economy. And, you, know, you will understand the reasons for that. Jeremy Corbyn. We're not asking for the entire UK economy to be closed down. We obviously want people to be safe, but clearly things have to, have to go on. My question was about the DWP resources, which the Prime Minister didn't answer. Well, I, I, well it wasn't an answer that was satisfactory to me. One of, his colleagues, one of his colleagues is claiming it was a yes. I'll take that. And so that means more staff now for the DWP, quickly, so we don't have 110,000 people waiting. Yeah, hang on, I haven't finished yet. Because my, my, question, my question is, Mr Speaker, while he's about it, and this will give him time to think of the answer, um, can he... This is not a time for levity. The statutory sick pay level of £94.25 a week, which the Health Secretary admitted he couldn't live on. And, de and despite promising he would ensure workers get the support they need, we've still not seen action on that. So unless we increase statutory sick pay and give protection and access to benefits for those on zero hours contract, then the dangers that we're all aware of, of people going into work or trying to work when they shouldn't, is going to continue. We do need very urgent action on this. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, he's absolutely right. This is not in, uh, a time for levity. It's a time for serious action and a serious response to the crisis. And that's what he's seen uh, from this government. And that's why, uh, from day one, uh, we, we, made it, uh, we insisted that statutory sick pay should be uh, payable uh, from, from day one. Uh, that's why we've advanced universal credit. And, and, and just to repeat the answer I gave a, a moment ago, Mr. Speaker, we've increased universal credit by £1,000 a year. That will benefit 4 million uh, people of the poorest families in the country. And and, and, and yes, we do want to see. We, I, I, I pay tribute, by the way, amongst the many fantastic workers in this country, not just in, in the NHS, not just in, in social care, uh, but of course in the teaching uh, profession, but, uh, but in the DWP itself. They're doing an incredible job. They're, doing, they're facing huge, huge new demands. They're doing an outstanding job. And yes, we will support them. And that's why we're putting another £7 billion, as I said just now, Mr. Speaker, into our welfare system. I don't want to appear totally negative, Mr Speaker, but it would be better if the, the whole place had been better staffed in the first place. But I'll take it for what the Prime Minister said, that there's going to be an increase in DWP staff in order that people can access universal credit more quickly. Um, Mr Speaker, it's quite right that Parliament is virtually closed today, and it's right that um, the Prime Minister and Cabinet Ministers continue to deliver daily public information uh, sessions, and that is absolutely correct. However, I understand it's going to be possibly some time before the House meets again, and there has to be scrutiny of what governments do. That is what Parliament is for. That is what oppositions exist for. And so I'd be grateful if the Prime Minister could indicate how, over the weeks until Parliament opens again, he's going to put himself open to some form of scrutiny, electronic, whatever it happens to be, so that Parliament can hold government to account because of the levels of stress and concern of all the constituents that we represent. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, the, the Honourable General is, is entirely correct. Uh, I think the, the way we've tried to handle this crisis is to be as open uh, and transparent as we possibly can with all our working, all our thinking, and I will work with you, if I may, Mr Speaker, about how we can make sure that Parliament is also kept informed uh, throughout the recess. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. All I can say to the Prime Minister on this is, please make sure you make yourself available for scrutiny by this House and by everybody else, because we represent people who are desperately worried about their health, about their economic well-being, and... If you're living in a small flat and you're told to isolate and you have a large family and a large number of children, the levels of stress are going to be huge. The levels of stress throughout our society are huge. It's up to all of us to do what we can to reduce those levels of stress and obviously bring this whole situation to a conclusion as quickly as we can. So we need clarity, not confusion. We need delivery, not dither. This crisis shows us, Mr Speaker, how deeply we depend on each other. We'll only come through this as a society through a huge collective effort. At a time of crisis, no one is an island. No one is self-made. The well-being of the wealthiest corporate chief executive officer depends on the outsourced worker cleaning their office. At times like this, Mr Speaker, we have to recognise the value of each other and the strength of a society that cares for each other and cares for all. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I, I really want to do nothing else except to associate myself fully with the, uh, the closing words of, of, the, of the Leader of the Opposition. And uh, I think that uh, what this country is doing now is utterly extraordinary. Uh, we are coming together as a nation in a way that I have not seen in my lifetime to help to defeat a disease and to help save the lives of many, many thousands of our fellow citizens. And we all understand that that will involve a sacrifice. But we're gladly making that sacrifice. And the most important point I can perhaps make to the House today is that that sacrifice is inevitable and it is necessary. But the more we follow the advice of the government, the more strictly we obey the measures that we have put in place, then the swifter and more surely this country will come back from the current crisis, the better we will recover. And so I just repeat my message in case 
uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman would like to hear it one more time. The best thing we can do is stay at home, protect our NHS and save many, many thousands of lives. Speaker, I echo my, the words of my Right Honourable Friend. Um, the current position on London transport is that the services have been severely curtailed. In fact, the journeys from his constituency into central London now are over every, one every 15 minutes as opposed to every five minutes. The result of that is huge packed trains with people who potentially are infecting other people. Clearly, those, some, some of those people are being selfish. What advice does my right honourable friend have for his successor of Mayor of London in resolving this particular problem on London transport? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I, the, 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 the Mayor of London, uh, I, can, I can assure him, uh, I, I understand very well the, 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 the job that, uh, that the, the current Mayor is, is doing, and uh, my own view is that we should be able to run a, a, a better tube system at the moment. We should be able to get more tubes on the line. But I will do what, we will do whatever we can. We will do whatever we I do not wish to... Uh, I do not wish in any way to, to cast aspersions on what, on what is going on at TfL at the moment because it is an outstanding, an outstanding organisation. What we will do is give, is give the Mayor every uh, support and help that we can to help him through what seem to me to be uh, his present logistical difficulties. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As of Monday, over 3,300 inquiries have been made in Scotland about NHS staff seeking to return to work in order to help us defeat the coronavirus. These people, and all those already working tirelessly within our NHS, are our heroes. Every last one of them, from consultants to cleaners, from carers to nurses, from drivers to maintenance workers, from GPs to paramedics, they are performing vital work to save the lives of others. When this crisis is over, we in this House will need to find some way to honour those amazing heroes. Yeah, yeah. But there is one way that the public can honour and support their NHS staff now, and that is by staying at home. Staying at home and adhering to social distancing will save lives, protect our health and social care services and begin to flatten the curve. We can avoid unnecessary deaths, but only if we all act together. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that we owe it to everyone in our NHS and to those willing to return for non-essential workers to stay at home? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I congratulate the Right Honourable Gentleman for the uh, splendid way in which he uh, expressed himself just now, and I think that message deserves to be heard loud and clear across the whole UK. Ian yeah. Blackford. Yeah. Well, can I thank the Prime Minister for what he has just said? Many members in this House will have had constituents contacting in recent days around evictions. Will the Prime Minister join me in praising Scotland's Community Secretary, Aileen Campbell, who has announced the Scottish Government's intention to use the emergency powers granted by the Coronavirus Bill to protect people from losing their homes? The Scottish Government's plan to impose a six-month ban on evictions from private and social rented accommodation are as welcome as they are necessary. And will the Prime Minister also join me in sending a message out from this House that in times like this we need a truly loving and compassionate society. No one, no one, Mr Speaker, should be facing the threat of evictions at a time of national emergency. Will the Prime Minister send out that message today? Yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. I want to, I want to repeat uh, what we're doing and the, the, the sense and the thrust of it. It's not just supporting uh, LHA, uh, putting a billion pounds uh, more back into supporting the, uh, the rented sector through local housing uh, allowance, uh, but also uh, stopping no-fault evictions. Now, the difference is between three months and six months. What I can tell uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman is we will certainly keep that protection under review. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd, I'd like to thank Broxbourne Borough Council, particularly the leader and the chief executive and all its staff for the brilliant work they're doing 
coordinating aid and support across my borough. Fantastic people working with a range of heroes. Prime Minister, there is an army of black cab drivers in and around London itching to get involved like the Spitfires in 1940. Prime Minister, can we find a way if we need to get doctors and nurses safely across London to use these black cab drivers, not on the metre, but perhaps on a contracted basis? Uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend makes a, a, a superb point, and uh, indeed that has already been uh, raised in our considerations. The black cab drivers are a fantastic service. Uh, they're an unsung service, and I believe that they can certainly uh, rise to this challenge. Hilary Benn. Much indeed, Mr. Speaker. We've already heard about the huge increase in applications for universal credit, and whatever measures the Chancellor comes forward with to help the self-employed will take time to implement. What is the government's plan to help people with no job and no income and no savings in circumstances where they don't have any money at all to buy food? What will the government do to make sure that no family goes hungry? Here, here, here. Well, we've, we've already increased uh, universal credit, but, we're, but the, what we are doing immediately, Mr Speaker, to, to help get cash to the, the poorest and neediest is to uh, give an immediate uh, grant of uh, 500 uh, million to local councils, and there will be more to come. This morning, I've been talking to the Solent Lep about the future plans for Waterlooville and my constituency. They are already planning for our recovery after this pandemic. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that this is the opportunity to plan for the future, make sure that we can rebuild a strong economy and become more community-minded than ever before? I, I do believe that this country will emerge better and stronger uh, from this experience, and I can certainly tell uh, my hon. Friend that a great deal of thought is being given now to the lessons we need to learn from this crisis and how we can turn them to the advantage of the British people in the future. Remember, is the Prime Minister aware that people are being evicted now, this week, as a result of losing their income, including all of those people who are being turfed out of low-cost hotels where they were being housed either in their own right or by the local authority? Is he aware that all his emergency legislation will do is defer evictions for two and a half months, storing up a problem further down the line? Can he tell us now what he is going to do to fulfil his government's commitment in full that nobody will lose their home as a result of this crisis. Here, here. She's, Mr Speaker, she's totally right to raise. Of course, the bill comes into force, uh, I believe, later today or as soon as their Lordships have, have, have finished with it. But as I said in answer to uh, the, the leader of the, of the, the SNP, uh, we, are, we will keep the three-month, it is three months, not two and a half months, the three-month period under review. Neil Parrish. Speaker. Like so many colleagues, my constituency has many, many self-employed. Um, farming, food and food production is very much self-employed um, businesses. Can we be assured that it won't be bureaucracy and the difficulty of setting up a system that stops that help getting to the self-employed? Because it's absolutely essential we cut through the bureaucracy to make it work. Uh, that is indeed the, the, the issue, Mr Speaker. It's, it's the, the, issue, the difficulty is not devising the schemes. We can devise the schemes. The difficulty is getting the cash to the people who need it in a timely way. And anybody who has worked uh, on any of these projects will know that that is the real issue, Mr Speaker. Atherson. Mr Speaker, some firms such as Sports Direct or Weatherspoons have shamed themselves by bullying their staff yeah, into work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other businesses are trying to do the right thing but are being let down by their insurance companies, such yeah. as events, sporting and conference companies in my constituency. Will the Government give a clear direction now that no large events involving large numbers of people should be taking place any time in the near future and insurance companies need to get their act together. Yes, yes. Uh, Mr Speaker, the instructions could not be clearer. The enforcement uh, is, uh, is there and it is going to be applied and the message should go out not only to those companies but to the insurers as well. Anthony Mandel. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister and his team for everything they've done so far, and can I associate my words with the Member for Tiverton and Honiton about the need to support rural and coastal communities? And with that in mind, what further support might we be able to expect regarding fishermen who are sitting on the line? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I, he is absolutely right, uh, and, uh, and he and I have have seen the wonderful uh, work that's done by the, uh, the, the fishing uh, community in, in his constituency, and they will receive all sorts of 
uh, benefits, not least, of course, uh, our ability in due time uh, to take back control of the, uh, of the plenteous resources uh, uh, off the UK coast. Wendy Chamberlain. Yesterday I spoke with a constituent who suffers from a debilitating rheumatic autoimmune disease and symptoms of her condition are similar to that of coronavirus. She's concerned that she won't be included in those to be shielded, even though she's clearly at risk, and she's concerned that she's going to end up needing emergency medical help as she takes different medications. Can the Prime Minister confirm that the Government is working with the devolved administrations to ensure that the shielding guidance is consistent across the UK? Minister. Uh, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. We're trying to make shielding guidance as consistent as we possibly can, but in her particular case, can I perhaps advise her uh, to, to get in touch directly with us and uh, we'll, we'll make sure that she's included. Ruth Edwards. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Nottinghamshire Police are asking local employers to give paid leave to special constables to allow them to help during this crisis. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that every business should be playing its part and that all special constables should be able to report for duty? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. And I should have added the police uh, and specials, uh, everybody who serves in our incredible uh, police uh, force for, for what they do, and they should certainly be added to the, to the role of honour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Speller. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tens of thousands of our constituents are stranded abroad. At the same time, thousands of planes and pilots are, sit are sitting idle. Mm. Ministry of Defence have unparalleled experience in chartering planes and organising flights. What they need, Prime Minister, is your instruction to do that. So when you go back to Downing Street, will you get onto the Ministry of Defence, tell them to get the airlift started and bring our people home? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, we certainly, uh, though not every country in the world necessarily uh, welcomes a, a, a grey tail fin, as it were, but uh, we, will, we, will, we will make sure we, will, we, we, are, we, have, uh, we are working with, most of them do, most of them do, I should say, but, we are, but charters uh, we are certainly uh, commissioning uh, right now, and there is a massive, massive uh, repatriation effort going on. Richard Holden. Mr Speaker, can I put on record the gratitude of my constituents to the leadership that has been shown by the, both the Prime Minister and the Health Secretary during this very difficult time for the whole country? Uh, coronavirus is showing our NHS at its best, including doctors, nurses and support staff in my North West Durham constituency, but it's also showing the strain in some parts of our NHS, including worn-out parts of the NHS estate. After the coronavirus pandemic outbreak has passed, will he and the Health Secretary work with me to look at delivering a new community hospital to replace the agent one at Shotley Bridge in my constituency. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, the, the short answer to that question is yes. And the long answer is this government is in no way undimmed in its ambition uh, to, build, to continue record investments uh, in our NHS and build 40 new hospitals, Mr Speaker. Should see Mike Donald. Yeah. To protect us all from coronavirus, we need to protect the most marginalised, and that includes asylum seekers, those whose asylum claims have been refused, and all who are prohibited from having access to public funds by Home Office rules. So will the Prime Minister encourage the Home Office to urgently and radically reform its policies so that everybody can access the support and accommodation they need to get through this crisis? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, this country will look after uh, all the most vulnerable in society in the way that uh, we always have, and uh, the the groups that he mentions will certainly uh, receive the Home Office funding that they, they need and deserve. Tom Hunt. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, the police will play a role in policing the social distancing guidelines outlined earlier this week. This will put an extra pressure on limited police resources. And my concern is that certain criminal elements might look to exploit this moment of national emergency to push their own insidious agenda. Will the Prime Minister promise me and my constituents that we will come down like a ton of bricks on those such individuals? Prime Minister. Uh, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. The, the early signs are that, uh, that criminal activity is, is not up, is in fact down at the moment, but we will come down uh, like a ton of bricks on anybody who seeks to exploit the situation. Chiamora. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The people of Newcastle are desperately trying to do the right thing, although my inbox tells me that they are angry, confused, running out of money, isolated and stranded in some cases. However, not all businesses are doing the right thing, and I am particularly thinking of Mike Ashley forcing workers into empty sports direct shops. The Prime Minister said that businesses should stand with their staff. What is his message to those who don't? Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, the advice to uh, the gentleman, uh, the instructions to the gentleman in question, and indeed every business is to follow what the government has said, to obey the rules or to expect the consequences. And that is the best way to look after not just their employees, but their businesses as well. Craig Williams. Can I welcome the Prime Minister's approach with devolution? Wales has two governments, and his mature and the Welsh Government's approach has meant we've delivered fast legislation and efficient help. But any divergence on policy or communication causes anxiety for my constituents. The Secretary of State for Health announced volunteering. Sadly, Welsh volunteers can't take place in that scheme, all over cross border. Will he get on the phone to the Welsh Government and say, let's work together? Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, I, may, I must say that in general, uh, the four nations of our United Kingdom have been working very, very well together, but I will, we will get on to, uh, to uh, the Welsh Government this afternoon on, on the issue that he addresses. Kerry okay. McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In Bristol, we're desperately trying to replace free school meals for children with, with home provision and other provision, but there's been real problems with the supply chain. How can we make sure that those providing those meals, including Andy Street at Feeding Bristol, who I really want to pay tribute to, can get hold of the food that they need so that kids can get good, healthy food while they're at yes. home? Prime Minister. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I thank her. She's given me an opportunity to, to say once again that it is our schools, our teachers, everybody who works in the schools who are dealing with an incredibly difficult situation, looking after the pupils of, of key workers, helping to keep our country going at a very difficult time, and the, uh, and the administration of uh, free school meals, supporting kids who need free school meals, is uh, an absolute top priority of ours. We are working at the moment on a voucher scheme. Right. Trying to summarise an MP's inbox right now is not easy, but mine would say self employed, please help us, and online delivery slots, which ones would they be? I trust the Prime Minister is going to deliver on the first, we've covered it a lot today, but on the latter, what can he realistically, given the demand, what can he realistically do? Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we changed the regulations so that uh, supermarkets have got much more freedom in their, in their delivery hours, and uh, it, obviously one of the uh, things we want to do is to make sure that we support people to become to help in this what is after all at the moment at the moment an expanding sector of the employment market and we don't want to be putting up any barriers uh, to the uh, to, to online delivery at all can I just say and wish the leader of the opposition well on his final question and can I say to the Prime Minister you have the wishes of everyone to make sure this country gets through this 